So in the previous video, we covered the idea of a cell response pathway called signal transduction that happens in water-soluble hormones. Now we're going to continue looking at a different cellular response pathway. So we'll entitle this cellular response pathways 2. But this time, of course, we're going to look at a different form of hormone, a different class of hormone, and that's going to be the lipid-soluble hormones. So how do they send an in extracellular, go from an extracellular message into an intracellular response? That's our basic question whenever we're looking at a cellular response pathway. So lipid-soluble hormones. So first and foremost, what we have to understand about these guys is that lipid-soluble hormones are going to be produced and also straight up diffused. They are produced and diffused out through the plasma membrane of an endocrine cell. Now, this is interesting. There's a little bit of a difference in this very first step compared to our previous very first step. Produced and diffused out through plasma membrane is what I want you to focus on of the endocrine cell. What did we not do here? We did not use exocytosis. So what I want you to write on the side here is that you did not do exocytosis, so no exocytosis. And that process was done specifically in water-soluble hormones because exocytosis needs to be done because the water-soluble hormones cannot go through the plasma membrane. They're water-soluble. The plasma membrane is majority hydrophobic with those very hydrophobic tails. So you can't just diffuse through the plasma membrane unless you are a lipid-soluble hormone. So therefore, you do not need to use exocytosis because you are lipid-soluble. You can easily float through that area of the plasma membrane that has the majority hydrophobic tails. Now, you might be wondering, well, how, what about those hydrophilic heads? How does it combat that? Lipid-soluble hormones, as you will see, actually have certain sections of them that have uh, hydrophilicity. They have hydrophilic functional groups like hydroxyl groups um, that can easily sort of maneuver away from or through the hydrophilic heads. The problem isn't really the hydrophilic heads, it's the hydrophobic tails because that's the majority of the plasma membrane, but they can combat that problem because they are majority lipid soluble. They have a few little portions of them that are hydrophilic that can go through the heads, but for the most part, they are hydrophobic and thus can go through, for the most part, a hydrophobic plasma membrane. Okay, so, so we now do not need exocytosis because we can just diffuse through. Cool, next. So once we diffuse through the endocrine cell, we now have to actually uh, have, we have a problem because we are now in an aqueous environment called the blood. And the blood will not allow us as a lipid soluble hormone to move around unless we do the next step, which is bind to something called a transport protein. So lipid soluble hormones have to bind to transport proteins. Yes, they may not have this problem of diffusing through a plasma membrane like the water soluble hormones do, but they have a problem of diffusing or going through the blood because they're not water soluble. So they have to bind to a transport protein. Those transport proteins in the blood are usually something called albumin. It's a very popular transport protein. I like to think of these as the taxis. The blood is the highway, and you can drive on the highway as long as you are within a car. And the car that's used here is a transport protein, and now that transport protein is usually going to be soluble. It is soluble in the blood. Thus, if you are within the car that is soluble within the blood, you yourself, as a lipid-soluble hormone, are now soluble in the aqueous blood environment. This was not a problem for our prior signal transduction pathway because we had naturally water-soluble hormones. They didn't need to hop onto a transport protein, but these are lipid-soluble, thus they need to go onto a protein, and that protein is, of course, going to be water-soluble, and thus, because you're on a water-soluble protein, you therefore are now soluble in an aqueous blood environment. Okay, so you've combated that problem. Nice. Next, you're going to travel. You're going to travel on this blood highway, and you're going to, of course, then reach your target destination. Specifically, you're going to get to your target cell. When you get to your target cell, you can easily diffuse now. You can diffuse into the cell. This is a big difference again, because before the hormone that was water-soluble 
problem, right? It got to the target cell receptor, could not get in because it could not deal with those hydrophobic tails of the of the lipid bilayer. So, but you as a water as a lipid soluble hormone can easily diffuse into the cell because you easily diffused out of the cell. Thus, you can do the same thing the other way around because you are soluble in the membrane. Soluble in membrane. Again, some people question the fact that, okay, but the hydrophilic heads, how do you get through that? You're basically going to have a, a hydroxyl group and you're going to go head first. You're going to go hydroxyl group first, polar group first, hydrophilic group first into the head region. Then you're going to sort of shift your shape so that your hydrophobic regions are going to, your lipid soluble regions will interact with the lipid soluble membrane and thus you will enter the cell. So it's sort of a maneuver, maneuvering that you do as a lipid soluble hormone to just simply diffuse into the cell. Now, once you've diffused into the cell, you have to do a couple of things. You, there's basically an option that happens here. And the two options are as follows. We'll do them independently. You're going to either bind to receptors. Bind. Remember, you have to bind to a target cell receptor. That's, everybody has to do that no matter what, no matter what type of solubility you have. You bind to receptors, but these receptors will actually be in the cytoplasm. So you diffuse through and then you bind to receptors in the cytoplasm and then you are going to create something called a hormone receptor complex, just like we did prior, but just a little bit different in terms of how we created the hormone receptor complex. Hormone receptor complex forms and when it forms, this can then go straight to nucleus, to the nucleus. Hormone receptor complex forms and then it goes to the nucleus. That's our first option. You bind to the receptor, you make a hormone receptor complex, then you travel straight to the nucleus. We'll understand why we're getting to the nucleus in just a second. Or you can go straight to the nucleus as a lipid soluble hormone. You can go, you can forget about binding to a uh, receptor in the plasma membrane, and you can go straight to nucleus and over there in the nucleus, because remember the nucleus has a nuclear membrane. The nucleus has a nuclear membrane, so you're still going to follow this rule of what? always binding to a receptor because now you go straight to the nucleus to form a separate and different form of a hormone receptor complex. The nucleus, believe it or not, also has receptors on it, the nuclear membrane, because it is a membrane just like the plasma membrane on the outside and thus it will also have receptors. So sometimes you'll have a situation where a lipid soluble hormone can just bypass this receptor and go to the receptor straight at the nucleus nucleus to form hormone receptor complex. Okay, so you've made either one of those choices. So now the whole goal is of course to get to the nucleus. Why are you trying to get to the nucleus? Both are trying to get to the nucleus for the following reason. Once you have reached the nucleus, you are then as a hormone receptor complex, the hormone receptor complex binds to specific sites in the DNA. So now this is where we absolutely need to remember some bio one. We cannot forget bio one because we're going to be looking at transcription and translation in just a second. What's the idea here? Key idea, specific sites of the DNA. The DNA has regions. You as a hormone receptor complex will bind to specific regions. This, is going, this binding is going to cause a conformational shape change in the DNA. So let's write this down. It's a conformational, that's always referring to the shape, but specifically conformational shape change in the DNA. Because now you have this thing that's bothering, not bothering the DNA, but altering the DNA in a way that its shape changes. The shape of DNA, as we know, is regulated through histone proteins, uh, the chromosome structure, all of that involves DNA shape. When you change DNA shape, you then change the capabilities of how DNA is transcribed and then subsequently translated. Either the shape change in the DNA can be made in a way where you make the DNA more accessible. More accessible to what? More accessible to proteins like polymerases, like an RNA polymerase, for example. If you are more accessible to RNA polymerase, you will then increase your mRNA. That's what RNA polymerase makes transcription. If you are more accessible, if you churn your shape in a way that says, hey, RNA polymerase, come here, I want you to transcribe this specific region because this hormone receptor complex is stuck on here and really pointing this region out for you to transcribe. Or the hormone receptor complex can say the complete opposite, where it will say, hey, RNA polymerase, stay away from here. I'm covering this region. I'm making sure that you do not do transcription here. So mRNA transcription can decrease depending on the way that the DNA shape change occurs.
if you increase mRNA transcription, you will then subsequently increase protein synthesis because that's going to be transcribed and translated into a protein. And that's going to be increased because you're increasing the amount of transcription and thus you have created an intracellular response. The goal was to take an extracellular message, lipid soluble hormone that has a message on it and then turn it into an intracellular response. The intracellular response has been reached because you have increased protein synthesis, because you have increased mRNA transcription, because you have changed the shape of the DNA based off of this orientation response that we saw. Or, again, or you can do the complete opposite. You can ch change the shape of the DNA in a way that it makes it very difficult for RNA polymerase to access the DNA. Thus, it makes it very difficult and decreases the amount of protein synthesis that's going to occur. And thus, you will also, because you're not getting a response, technically, that's also a response, right? I'm going to put this in quotes because technically, not doing anything is also a response. Sometimes, the message that the hormone, the lipid-soluble hormone, is trying to tell the cell is calm down, stop doing what you're doing. Negative feedback loop, remember that? This whole idea here is simply called repression. Sometimes you can have a chemical message from a lipid-soluble hormone telling you to repress mRNA transcription, translation, and thus repress protein synthesis as a whole, or you can tell it to activate and further uh, and um, amplify protein transcription, and thus you'll still get a response. So hopefully this stepwise orientation wasn't too confusing stepwise pattern that we did. If it was, I highly suggest taking a look at figure 45.7. You cannot understand these complex pathways of cellular response from the extracellular uh, message to the intracellular response without looking at the, step is, the steps that are involved. I also suggest looking at the playlist for this section of the site, for this lecture specifically, because I made an emphasis of putting videos that show signal transduction, that show lipid-soluble cellular response pathways. And that covers our look at these response pathways of hormones.